stage, we have our next session is going to be a combined on stage and virtual session. Um, we're going to be talking about ARPANET and the first steps towards the internet. To lead that conversation from here, we have Chris Mondini, who is the Managing Director of Europe for ICANN, and joining us virtually, the President and CEO at Edgemore Research Institute, Steve Crocker. Welcome to the stage, Chris. Hello again. Uh, I really, it's my lucky day to be working with so many internet pioneers and uh, introduce them all to you for those of you who don't know them. It's an honor and a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Steve Crocker, one of the key contributors of the ARPANET project, which was the precursor of the modern internet. He participated in the development of both the ARPANET protocols and the initial organizational structure of the protocol development process. You may have heard of the request for comments, the RFCs, which were Steve's idea and originally intended as a temporary way to share technical details among operators. And fast forward to today, and we have a rich multi-layer protocol architecture. We have the Internet Engineering Task Force, all of which evolved from this early work and which we'll be hearing more about today. So again, it is my honor to ask you to join me in welcoming uh, an internet icon, Dr. Steve Crocker. Welcome, Steve. Hi there. So, uh, so uh, I'm pleased to share the stage with you, even if it's virtually, and I'm delighted that you're here with a very full house in, in CloudFest. We have an audience of very enthusiastic and energetic uh, business people that are operating their hosting and cloud companies and expanding their businesses. Um, my question, my first question for you, Steve, is uh, tell me, why should they care about the domain name system. We just talked about that in the last session. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you, Chris. Uh, you and I have worked together before, and uh, this is a delight. I wish I could be there in person. Although, as you can see, I've got uh, the uh, San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge uh, behind me because I'm sitting in San Francisco at the moment, uh, which is not an unpleasant place to be, I have to say. Uh, before we get into the parts that we agreed we're going to talk about, I was listening, listening to the last session with, um, with Bert and with Paul. Uh, let, me, let me just add a, an answer to the question that was asked at the tail end of that meeting. What kind of things are important for uh, going forward for the domain name system? Uh, in addition to the, uh, the answer that Bert Bird and uh, Paul gave about content and, and uh, more uses. Uh, one of the stress points in the domain name system is the provisioning. This is the unlovely part behind the scenes of how do you get the right data in the right place so that when questions are made, are, are presented, you get back the answers you want. How do you update those databases? And more particularly, one of the things that has uh, emerged over the past couple of decades and becoming more and more important is building extra redundancy into the system so that even if there is partial failure, uh, the service remains uh, up and running as seen by everybody who uses it. Uh, I've been working in that area and uh, I think it, it doesn't get very much uh, press, uh, which is fine because if it did get press, it'd probably be for the wrong reasons. But uh, one of the things that I think is quite important is the, uh, as I say, the improvement in the provisioning process, more automation, uh, uh, because when you put the automation in, you get regularity, uh, consistency, and uh, you avoid some number of human errors. Not all of them, but uh, the more that we can reduce, the better. Um, so apologies for uh, sort of going off script, as it were. But uh, let's get back to the uh, set of questions that we've agreed to. Well, I think actually I can glean from what you just said, Steve, already some actionable advice where you recommend things like automation and redundancy and DNS 
Um, and the question really is about the importance of DNS to cloud companies. And you can answer it from a technical point of view or, or a business strategy point of view. But what would you, what would you tell the audience? Well, um, it's absolutely crucial. Uh, you can't have the cloud services uh, or your hosting without the domain name system working properly. Um, so it, th there's just no question that it's absolutely essential. But uh, sort of in line with what I was saying before, uh, what you want is for it to work so smoothly that you stop thinking about it. Of course, critical people have to continue to think about it. If, you have, if you're running an operation, you better have the responsibility for making sure that everything is working properly, that uh, you're configured right. Uh, it's amazing the number of times that uh, I don't think this happens with with serious hosting companies and serious cloud providers, but people let their domain names expire, for example, and then uh, that's a very bad day when the uh, registrar takes it out of service because you haven't paid your bill, and then worse yet, when they put it up for uh, somebody else to take it over. So uh, uh, those sort of straightforward things need to be very carefully managed. Um, uh, let me let me let me escalate a little bit and and emphasize it this way. Uh, it only costs a few dollars a year to maintain a domain name. The cost of a disruption, losing it even temporarily, is usually measured for 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 big companies measured in hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars. So the disparity between what it costs and what the impact it has if you lose it is is quite severe, and that's kind of unlike. Uh, other kinds of assets that a company might have. So I've had I've had the experience, for example, of talking with a, a, a C-suite person uh, randomly on, a, on an airplane making conversation. I says, so who manages your your uh, domain name? I, I don't know. We, we have it under control. Uh, but uh, upon follow up with that, it turned out that it was not very much under control. And uh, he sent me a note later thanking me for raising the issue. Uh, uh, on the other hand, if you were talking about any kind of physical asset, a building or computers or or, or even other forms of intellectual property, you find that the uh, uh, oversight of the management and control of the, of the asset is uh, tightly connected to the very top levels of the organization, uh, either a CFO or the legal department or or something uh, comparable. If you ask, you know, sort of who's managing your domain names, uh, you may get a quizzical look, and uh, it's buried three levels down below the sea level. Uh, and and if there's a change in personnel, if somebody leaves or any other sort of disruption, uh, chaos ensues. So uh, that's kind of an extended answer to, to your question there. Yeah, I think that's great and very strategic, in fact, to really consider the domain as an asset worthy of investment and management, uh, careful management. And, I, you know, it's, I, 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 do you think that that's underappreciated in businesses just because of the way the DNS evolved and grew up, you know, before, uh, it's always been there. It, 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 why do you think it's undervalued in the companies that you're talking about and that CEO wasn't paying attention? Well, uh, it, I think it's undervalued for a couple of uh, interrelated reasons. One is it's, it's fundamentally very simple and in that sense, not too interesting. Uh, uh, it, it is not a money-making proposition uh, usually, so that uh, that's not where the focus is for people who are in business and worrying about where their revenue is coming from and how do they grow their revenue. Uh, and. As I said, the dollar investment is very, very small. So that doesn't attract very much attention. It doesn't show up as a line item in a budget that is considered, you know, what, how much money are we going to spend on DNS next year? Uh, it might be more than just the cost of domain names. It's the cost of maintaining the servers and, uh, and so forth. But even so, it tends to be a modest cost compared to everything else. So I think for those reasons, it tends not to get very much attention and, and uh, sort of to borrow the line, doesn't get any respect um, <laughs> until, of course, when something goes wrong and then, oh my goodness, uh, who's in charge and well, how did that happen to us? Okay, okay. So it may not be thought of as a money maker, but it's absolutely crucial and uh, uh, 
necessary and ubiquitous and global and has always been working. Uh, I want to turn, though, to some of the potential threats to the global DNS, because um, we live in this time of a lot of geopolitical tension. We have a lot of regulatory activism. Do you see any risks of uh, fragmentation or risks to companies like the hosting and cloud companies here that might be knock-on effects of that tension? Do I see any risks? Well, it's almost too late to worry about the risks. The, the effects are here. Uh, you have uh, fragmentation of various forms. Um, and uh, you even have fragmentation for some uh, relatively positive reasons in that uh, it's possible to provide a different experience in different parts of the world when somebody makes a DNS lookup. And those can be done for good reasons as well as for what we might consider to be negative reasons. Um, but you know, the, the, the general thrust of the question you're asking is the intersection between the technology and the various geopolitical forces. Uh, quite a few countries have expressed the notion that they ought to be able to control uh, what their citizens see and what they can have access to, uh, and they want to manage the information flow among their among their populations. Um, and and when they pursue that goal, uh, the domain name system is a very attractive and readily available source. Uh, to be able to emphasize that control. So uh, if your next question is, so what should uh, hosting providers and cloud providers do about that? I would say one of the things is to make sure that you have a service that is uh, redundant across the globe uh, so that uh, there's no single point at which it can be uh, shut off from people uh, and, and you know, provide redundancy and resiliency uh, not only against forces of nature, which intrude from time to time, a cut cable or, or something else, but also uh, political forces that t sometimes intrude. So uh, that's very useful uh, advice. And following up on the sort of political angle that you mentioned, I made reference to regulatory activism as one sort of, I would say, creeping form of potential fragmentation. So the redundancy on a technical and operational layer, that's a, that's a very clear, uh, actionable piece of advice. But do you think that there should be more collective action in this sector around? It, I mean, I'm thinking of your experience in spurring the idea of global standards and information sharing and so forth. Is there any collective action that could also address these kind of regulatory threats? Well, uh, let me, let me uh, turn attention to the areas that you and I have worked in uh, for many years together, which is the, uh, uh, in the context of ICANN. ICANN is a, a multi-stakeholder organization that was formed to provide a, a, a home and operational basis for the domain name system, uh, principally. Uh, and to bring together in a, in a multi-stakeholder uh, structure uh, the various groups and entities and countries and so forth that have an interest in all of this. One of the things that uh, has emerged is that cloud providers and uh, hosting providers aren't actually present in any great extent within this environment. You have the uh, DNS registries and, the, and you have the registrars and uh, uh, certain other uh, stakeholders. But there is no, if you look at this complicated org chart that you and I know so well, and you say, okay, so where are the cloud providers? Nope. Where are the uh, uh, hosting providers? Nope. Uh, you can find down on the bottom of the org chart uh, an ISP con constituency and say, so, so they sort of fit there perhaps. But that's almost a throwaway line if I, if I might be a little bit impolite uh, about our favorite organization. Uh, so the solution, to the extent that a solution is, is desired, is for some form of collective action uh, across uh, the hosting and cloud providers uh, to show up and say, uh, 
excuse me, where's our seat at the table? Um, here's what our issues are. Here's what we need to be involved in. And to uh, generally make yourself known. And so would you, a couple questions that follow from that. Would you envision that under an umbrella like the ICANN umbrella or, or elsewhere? And, and you said to the extent that a solution is desired, which then, of course, I think would raise in the, the minds of the audience here, is there also a business case? Is there a business case uh, even beyond just what I talked about addressing a regulatory risk, but what's the balance between collective action and you know, robust competition in a sector like this, in your view? Well, uh uh, I'm afraid my mind moves more toward the negatives than the positives in the sense that the business case is how to prevent uh, bad things from happening uh, uh, on the regulatory front, uh, how to prevent bad things from happening on the operational front I, I sort of spoke to earlier. Uh, to your question as to whether the right place for this sort of collective action is within ICANN or external, uh, I think that's... Uh, an interesting question without a clear-cut answer. And in the case where you don't have a clear-cut answer, the uh, the natural thing is, well, do both. Uh, show up inside ICANN, show up outside of ICANN, and sort of see where, uh, where progress gets made. Inside of ICANN has the advantage that you're then t uh, interacting with all the other forces and uh, uh, you sort of duke it out. Um, uh, directly. Outside of ICANN has the advantage that you then don't have to deal with the ICANN mechanisms and bureaucracy and uh, the um, uh, kind of drag that you have to go through with the rather extended multi-stakeholder process that's run. Um, and so you can get perhaps greater agility, but of course you're not inside the tent then and uh, 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 becomes unclear whether or not that is the better way to proceed or not. So as I say, uh, in the absence of a clear-cut answer for uh, within or without, I would say do both. <laughs> do both. That's the, that's the great answer. Um, I'm glad that you were able to listen in on the last session because there was some talk about uh, turning now to something that you've been, a, a, frankly, a hero and advocate I I in which is security, stability, and resilience of the DNS. And um, you know there was some discussion about security in the last panel. And I wanted to ask you about that, uh, and in particular about uh, DNSSEC. Um, you, know, you alluded to the greater investment and better management of, of assets. But what, what, are the, what can we learn from the introduction of uh, DNSSEC or other practices uh, in the cloud space? Well, um, uh, quite a while ago, in the roughly 1990-91 time frame, uh, it was discovered that it was possible to create great chaos uh, by inserting uh, bogus answers to DNS queries and fool the question, the questioner. So uh, a, a customer would ask, uh, or their system would ask, what's the IP address associated with a particular domain name? <coughs> and a bad guy could uh, speak more quickly than the than the authoritative servers and suggest an answer. And there was nothing that precluded uh, the uh, original system from believing the answer that it got back. So that led uh, to uh, it led fairly quickly to the idea. Well, we have to add digital signatures to all of this and provide a very firm basis for believing the answers that come back. Uh, despite the fact that the realization the, that that was necessary uh, happened very quickly, the implementation, the design, the implementation, experimentation of, of, of uh, details has taken a very very long time. Uh, culminating in a way with the signing of the root in um, 2010 and uh, requirement by ICANN that every uh, new GTLD have uh, uh, be signed and accept delegations, signed delegations from the registrants. And 
a fairly good, not perfect, but fairly good uptake on the CCTLD side. Um, one of the things that has been discovered uh, about uh, uh, about DNSSEC, and I, I'm going to interrupt myself here and and give uh, very high credit to Paul McApetris for the design of DNS. It was an extraordinary success. And one of the characteristics of its success is that you could configure it uh, once, and if you didn't make any change to the system you were running, you just let it be, and it just runs forever and ever. Uh, and I emphasize that because with the introduction of DNSSEC and uh, uh, some of the rules about uh, uh, changing your keys every so often, uh, there was uh, all of a sudden it became necessary to have regular updates to your DNS uh, records and your DNSSEC uh, records in particular, but the consequence with uh, uh, re-signing the entire zone. Uh, and that that is a change equivalent to, uh, I liken it to, to those of you who know something about airplanes. Uh, simple airplanes, when you take your hands off the controls, uh, will fly straight and level. Uh, when you're up at the very extreme end of uh, uh, airplane designs, uh, think of uh, advanced fighter jets uh, in the military, uh, active controls are necessary, that if you take your hands off the controls, uh, you're doomed. Uh, you are actively controlling the surfaces all the time. There's a comparable effect with DNSSEC, that uh, you, you have to be alert, uh, not in a second-by-second -second basis, but uh, you can't let it go for years and not touch it. Uh, so that has changed uh, the level of attention that's necessary. Uh, and uh, uh, with it, some number of operational problems emerge that catch people by surprise. It's one of the reasons why I've been spending quite a bit of my time trying to address the operational side of DNSSEC provisioning. How do you, how do you automate that and reduce the uh, amount of attention that's needed on a manual basis or an ad hoc basis. Well, this is uh, what is uh, so many things that are so impressive, but the ability to cover topics from governance and policy to technical security operations, and also fact that, Steve, that you've really devoted and continue to devote your career to advancing uh, the security and making sure that these systems work for all of us. We're down really to our last minute of the session, and everybody's in rapt attention, even though I know we have a beer blast coming up. So I, I, do you have any closing comment? It could be a word of advice or some uh, hope for the future for this audience to send us off to our, to our uh, happy hour? Um, uh, let me offer this. Um, you know, when, when the network was first formed, and when I say the network, I, I go all the way back to the ARPANET, it was uh, a kind of co-equal system with hosts that were both consuming and providing services on the net. There, were, it, there was not, at the outset, a, uh, a division between those who were providing services and those who were using services. Uh, what's emerged over time, and very, very obviously in this context with hosting providers and cloud service providers, uh, a very robust and, and vibrant and uh, very, very important uh, organization, if you will, in the environment in which the service providers uh, uh, become the mainstay pretty much of, uh, of providing services on the internet. Uh, I, think, I think this is perfectly ordinary and healthy. Uh, there was nothing in the original design or conception that was antagonistic to that. We made a point of not making it a requirement that that be the, the way things were. And that requirement uh, or, or that latitude made it possible for new services to spring up arbitrarily, which they have. And But on the other hand, there was a, a recognition right from the beginning that the kind of uh, service provider versus service user distinction would it was a very natural occurrence and would uh, and would emerge so I, I think the state of the uh, industry at, uh, as it is now is uh, quite good quite excellent and uh, uh, deserves uh, recognition and appreciation 
for the quality that it provides because now it makes it possible for anybody to develop uh, a, a new application or a new service and just know that the infrastructure for supporting it is there. And I think that that ought to be uh, uh, treasured and given a full weight in consideration uh, uh, without, of course, closing the door to any new entrants that come in. But the, the basic idea uh, that we've got a superior infrastructure that you can build on, uh, I think, is the uh, main takeaway uh, for this period of time. Well, on that very inspiring note of appreciation for all that we have, I would like to invite the audience to express appreciation for you and your participation. So a round of applause for Steve. Thank you for being with us. It was a pleasure. Wonderful. Thank, thank you, Thank Chris. you so much. Chris, thank you so much. Appreciate your time and hard work on this. Cheers.